Hey guys, Miss Peterson here, and this is AP Physics 2, Lecture 1-2, all about the buoyant force. We're going to be talking about buoyancies, Archimedes' principle, um, apparent weight, corresponds to section 11.6 in your textbook. So, what is buoyancy? Well, the buoyant force is just the force the upward force exerted on an object submerged in a fluid. Okay, and we've experienced this. We know it's easier to lift objects while they're in the pool. Okay, we see things float. We know that more dense objects sink and less dense objects float. Cool. But where does that buoyant force come from? Okay, now we are going to picture a pig submerged in water. Okay, this pig has, oops, Come on. Okay. This big has some area on the top and some area on the bottom. It is submerged in a fluid. Okay. And then we know pressure is force over area. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare the force on the top versus the bottom of the pig. So that force we can think of as the pressure times that area. So this is our height of the pig. At the top of the pig, we will get a pressure of P naught, atmospheric pressure, press rho G H1, that height, that top height, versus at point two, we'll have P naught plus rho G H2, those difference in depths. And then it has surface area A, so to get that force, it would be that pressure times that area. Now, the buoyant force actually results from the difference in these pressures. So let's go ahead and write that. The force of buoyancy equals the difference in those pressure. We know that pressure is going to be highest on the bottom, so I'm going to go ahead and put that one on the bottom. Okay, we have P naught plus rho g um, h2 times that area minus p naught plus rho g h1 times that area. Okay. Now, this is a subtraction. So, if we're just looking at this, those areas are going to multiply by the p naughts. We're going to assume the areas are the same. Bit of an oversimplification, but I'll show you guys why it works out. Okay, so we can cancel out those pressures. And then I'm going to go ahead and move the rho g out of both of those terms. And we'll end up with rho g times the area times height 2 minus height 1, where, hey, wait a minute. If we are taking the surface area of the pig and multiplying it by the height of the pig, this term right here is the volume of the object, okay, in this case, the pig. So, our equation becomes that the force of buoyancy equals rho, and again, we're talking about the pressure in the fluid. So that's going to be the density of the fluid times gravity times the volume of our object. Okay? And that's what you guys see on your equation sheet. Okay? It is that the buoyant force. Okay, they move it around a little bit. It's rho v g, where rho is the density of the fluid. And v, note v will always be the volume submerged, which might not be the whole volume of the object. Okay. The buoyant force is only going to be the volume of the submerged one. So, 
To summarize, okay, buoyancy depends on the density of the fluid. Okay, that's what determines that difference in pressure. That's what determines how much the water molecules or the fluid molecules are pushing up versus pushing down. So it's that density of the fluid which matters. Okay, and it depends on the volume submerged. So if this pig was a floaty pig, we would only be concerned with this volume, okay, and the density of the fluid, not the density of the pig, okay. Buoyancy does not depend on the density of the object. Does the density of the object affect whether it floats or sinks? Yes, because it has to do with the relative densities, but it does not directly affect that buoyant force, okay? And it does not have to do with the mass of the object. Well, that equation might look a little bit familiar. I want to look at, okay, so we got buoyant force equals rho v g. And... This rho is the density of the fluid, and that volume is the mat, is the volume of that displaced fluid. So we can also think of that density times rho. Density is mass over volume. So if we have density times volume, that is just the mass. But specifically, the mass of that displaced fluid. times g. So this, hey wait, that's just weight. Mass times gravity, that's just weight. The buoyant force equals the weight of the displaced fluid. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Now, that idea of the buoyancy being the weight of the displaced fluid is called Archimedes' principle. Okay? Archimedes' principle is that every object is buoyed upward by a force equal to the weight of the fluid that that object displaces. Okay? Notice, it's equal to the weight of the force of the fluid that it displaces. So, if we're looking, for example, at this cork aluminum and lead ball, which of them would experience the largest buoyant force? All of them would experience the same buoyant force. If they're all underwater, they're all displacing the same amount of fluid, so we would all be the same. Okay? Same volume displaced. And same fluid. So how would it change if they were in salt water versus salt fresh water? Well, salt water has a higher density. So the buoyant force on all of them would increase. Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and look at at the three different situations where we will be considering that buoyant force. Okay, first one, we have an object that floats. So, let's think about those densities. Okay, if something floats, then we know that the density of the object is less than the density of the fluid. Okay. But if an object is floating, by definition, it is not moving, okay? It's not moving up or down. It's floating. So the buoyant force on it is going to equal the force of gravity. For an object that floats, it will only displace enough water until the weight of the water it's displaced equals its weight, okay? That's how floating works. So if we were drawing this free body diagram... For our object, we would just have the force of gravity 
and the force of buoyancy. And these would be equal. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and look at when an object is sinking. So if we had an object and it is currently moving downward, its velocity is downward. Well, if an object is sinking outside of any external forces, then we know that it must be more dense than the fluid. Okay. If it is currently sinking, which force is winning? The downward force, the force of gravity. So the force of gravity will be greater than that force of buoyancy. And that's what we would draw in our free body diagram. We would have the force of gravity and then a smaller force of buoyancy. Okay. What about when the object is on the bottom, okay? When it has sunk and now it's just sitting on the bottom. Well, if it can sit on the bottom, then we know its density is going to be greater than the density of the fluid. Yep. And then what forces are acting on the block? Okay, we have more forces going on here. We know that the force of gravity must be greater than the force of buoyancy because that didn't change in between these two situations. Okay? But now there's another force supporting it because the block isn't moving. The force of gravity will equal that force of buoyancy plus the normal force. Okay? The bottom of that container will exert a normal force on that object. So if we're looking at its free body diagram, we have the force of gravity acting on it, as well as a buoyant force and a force of tension. Oh, sorry, I don't know why I said tension. Normal, okay, normal force. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So now let's go ahead and talk about apparent weight. Okay, so here I have a scale hanging from a digital balance, okay? A spring scale. Now, if we look very closely at this measurement, with the scale hanging in air, it's at about 2.0 newtons, okay? So with the object in air, the spring scale is reading 2.0 newtons, okay? Now, I'm going to go ahead and submerge it in water. Yep. And we can watch what happens. I can feel the difference in the tension on it and now, what is it reading? Making sure it doesn't hit the bottom of the container. Okay. So lift it back up so it's not hitting the bottom. And now it's looking at like it's at about 1.7 newtons. Okay. About 1.7 newtons. The spring scale is reading 1.7 newtons. Why is it less? Because that force of buoyancy. This force is just the force of gravity on the object, where this force is the force of gravity minus that force of buoyancy. So we can see that when this object was in the water, its buoyant force was its force of gravity minus 1.7 newtons, okay? To get that force of buoyancy is 0 0.3 newtons. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and do some example problems. This one is a classic problem, and it's a great one, the pirate ship problem. We have a pirate ship hiding out at a small inshore lake. It carries tre 20 treasure chests in its hold. On the horizon, it looks out, and it gets away. It wants to drop the heavy treasure to drop into the lake. So...
let's go ahead and draw a picture of what's going on here. We have a small lake, and then we have a pirate ship. Okay, there's my pirate ship. And it has some treasure in it. And it is going to drop the treasure off of the boat. And it wants to know what happened, what will happen to the water level when that happens. Okay? Think about it. And now let's go ahead and look at it. So, here I have my water. Okay, this is going to be my lake. It's a very small lake. And here I have my pirate ship with gold treasure in it. So, I'm going to put the treasure into the uh, boat and put it in our lake. Okay, and it does float, okay, it still floats, and we see that water level. I'm gonna go ahead and mark that water level. Okay, so there we go, the water level's marked with that boat floating. Now, from the treasure chest, we are going to remove the treasure, throw it overboard into the lake, and let's put the boat back. And the water level decreased. The water level decreased. Why? Okay. Well, let's reason it out. Now we know that the water level decreased. And there's a couple different ways to make sense of it. But let's go ahead and think of it versus in the boat versus bottom of the lake. So first, when the treasure is in the boat, okay, those forces are balanced. So then we know that the force of gravity on the boat plus the treasure must equal the force of buoyancy on the boat and treasure. Okay? Well, that's true. So basically, it's going to displace enough water to equal the mass of the boat and water. Displaces volume of water um, to equal weight of a boat and treasure. But what about when that treasure is now at the bottom of the lake? Okay, we know now the ship's lighter, so it's floating up a little bit higher. The water level went down, and now that's on the bottom. So now there's another force involved, okay? Yeah, we still have that the force of gravity on the boat equals the force of buoyancy on the boat. But for the treasure, we have the force of gravity on the treasure is going to be equal to the force of buoyancy on the treasure plus the normal force. So that normal force is now supporting some of its weight, okay? The buoyant force doesn't have to support all of its weight. It displaces less water when submerged, okay? Ah! I switched to blue. Displaces only its volume. Okay, only the volume of treasure. Where when it's in the boat, it displaces so that greater than the volume of the treasure because it has to displace enough water to equal its weight, which is going to be more water than treasure because, you know, water is less dense than the treasure. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Let's look at another one. A helium balloon has a volume of 0.3 meters, 
Okay, so we got a helium balloon. A helium balloon with a volume of 0 0.03 meters cubed. It is filled with helium. Okay, if the density of helium is 0 0.2 kilograms per meter cubed, and the density of air around it is 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed. We're going to ignore the weight of the rubber balloon. And it's asking for the net force on the balloon. So let's go ahead, draw a quick little free body diagram. What forces are acting on the balloon? Well, we have the force of gravity and the force of buoyancy. So now I know that helium balloons tend to float. Okay, or I could set the down direction as negative. It doesn't really matter. But basically, we know that the net force is going to the be the buoyance force minus that force of gravity. So subbing in what we know for buoyancy, it's going to be the density of the air, the fluid the balloon is in, times that volume of the balloon times G minus the force of gravity on the balloon. Now, I don't have information to say what the mass of my balloon is, so I'm going to go ahead and express the weight of it in terms of density, where it'll be the density of the helium times that volume of the balloon. That gives you the mass of that helium times G. So let's go ahead and simplify this equation down, and we'll have F net. Um, I can factor out G and the volume. So the volume of the balloon times gravity times the difference in those pressures, P air minus P helium, okay? And then let's plug in the numbers. We have the volume of the ball, 0 0.03. I'm going to go ahead and use 9.8 for gravity. If you use 10, that's fine. Times the difference in those air pressures, so 1.2 minus 0 0.2 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay. So you plug that all into your calculator and you get 0 0.3. Okay, Checking out the units, we have meters cubed, canceling out with meters cubed, which leaves us with units of kilogram meters per second squared, aka newtons. So if the net force on the balloon is 3 newtons, how many balloons would it take to lift a small child with a mass of 40 kilograms? So if we wanted to lift the child with the balloons, go ahead and draw that situation. There we go. There we go we would need the force of buoyancy to at least be equal to that force of gravity on the child. <clears throat> so we have that the force of gravity must equal that force of buoyancy, and it's the buoyant force due to those balloons. Force of gravity on the child will be 40 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, acceleration due to gravity, equals that buoyant force, 0 0.3 newtons, which we had just calculated as that net force on the balloon. Um, so yeah, I should actually say net force. Okay, net on balloons. Yep, times some number of balloons x. Okay, how many balloons would we need? So when you plug that into your calculator, you have 40 times 9.8 divided by 0.3, and you get that x is 13,006.666, so I'll go with 1307 balloons. So about 1,300 balloons. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Let's look at one more example problem. So we have a mass that is suspended from a spring scale that reads 5 newtons. So when it's just in air, okay, that tells us that the force of gravity acting on it 
is five newtons. When the mass is submerged in water, okay, so when the mass is submerged in water, the spring scale reads 4.2 newtons. So the force of gravity minus the force of buoyancy is going to be 4.2 newtons. Since we know that force of gravity is 5, that tells us that the force of buoyancy acting on this block is 0 0.8 newtons. Okay. Now, where did that buoyant force come from? Well, it came from the fluid. So that force of buoyancy is equal to the density. Oh, it's submerged in water. So the density of the water times the volume of the object because it displaces its volume. Okay. Times g. Okay. Now, is that going to give me the density of my object? No, not yet. But I can use it to find the volume of my object. And since I know the force of gravity, okay, we know if the force of gravity is 5.0 newtons, and that's its mass times gravity. Um, we know gravity is about 10. Most of these numbers are just 2, 1, sig fig. I'm just going to use 10. So I get a mass of my object of 0 0.5 kilograms. So I know the mass. All I need to know is its volume, and I'll be able to find its density. So go ahead and plug in. Buoyant is 0 0.8 newtons. The density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. I'm solving for the volume. And again, I'm just going to use 10 to make my math easier. When we only have one sig fig on most of our numbers, it is totally fine to do that. So then we get a volume of our object to be 0.8 divided by 1,000 times 10, 10,000. And we get 8 times 10 to the negative 5 cubic meters. So now to find density. Density is mass over volume. So we have its mass, 0 0.5 kilograms, divided by its volume, which we just found. So its density is approximately 6,250 kilograms per cubic meter. Rounding it off, about 6,000. And that's it for buoyancy. Okay, cool. Okay, cool.